All right, open your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. We will be reading this morning verses 8 through 17. There's a 8 through 17. I uh, gave Amy the wrong information. So that, uh, that bulletin mistake is uh, all mine. That would be the English service one. And in the Spanish service, I put tomorrow as the date. So I'm on a roll. We will be reading verses 8 through 17. If you'd please rise for the reading of God's word. Luke chapter 1, verses 8 through 17. Thus says God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit uh, and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to wisdom of the just, to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Amen. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the veracity of your word and we Thank you for the sufficiency of your word. We humbly ask as we gather this morning that you give us wisdom and discernment as regards your word. We desire by your Holy Spirit to have eyes that see your word and ears that hear and understand your word and a mind and a heart willing and able and capable of engraving the truth of your word upon them, that we may not sin. Father, we also ask that by your Spirit you ignite a fire within us, a drive and a determination to put to deed the word that we are to encounter this morning and every time we read your word. We ask this in Christ's name and for Christ's glory. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This is a part one. This is the first part one of Luke, the first of many. We will be reading and meditating on the silence which was broken. And of course, uh, we would have been able to meditate on this a little bit more, but by the Lord's providence, wasn't able to have that sermon this Advent series, so a little bit of that information is going to be already here. We start in verse 8, seeing how incredible it is in the Lord's providence that it would be a man whose name means the Lord remembers. That's what Zechariah means. A man of righteousness and who walked blamelessly before God, who would bear witness to the 400-year silence being broken. And this, too, during an event that many other priests 
would honestly never get the opportunity to experience in their lifetime. We've talked uh, in a couple of the prior Advent series and we've spoken as we get to see names having meaning over the last five or more years, how very different society is now compared to in Christ's time or in the time of Zechariah and his parents, obviously, because he didn't name himself. And how it is that we see that names matter, just like words matter. And Zechariah's name is no coincidence. It is a divine providence, an outworking of God's will that a righteous priest, one who walks blamelessly before God, seeking after righteousness in all of God's laws and statutes, would have a name that means the Lord remembers. And what is it that the Lord remembers? And and how does this tie into what we are meditating on this moment, the silence being broken? We got to talk about that last week and meditate on how it is that God had made promises, not just in the Old Testament writ large, but specifically in Malachi of the one that was to come, of the promised Messiah, of that great and dreadful day of the Lord that would come, and of a forerunner. And here we are 400 years later, and Zechariah is here, whose name means the Lord remembers. And he is participating in an event that, with all honesty, most priests would not get to participate. And you'll see as we continue digging in that not only is the fact that he was by lot selected to be a part of the priestly duty in the temple, but also the fact that he was going to be the one praying and and burning incense. Both of these things are events that would not likely happen to the vast number of priests. Luke records for us that while he was serving as priest before God, when his division, the division of Abijah, was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. So twice over, Zechariah is chosen by lot. First, his division is chosen by lot to serve in the temple when the rest would be serving in various other areas and in other temples. And again, he is chosen from among the division to be among those and to be the one who would burn the incense and offer up the prayer for the nation. It was due to the the high numbers of priests that the privilege of serving in the temple was drawn up by a lot. We wanted, they wanted to keep things Fair. They wanted to keep things as equal, in a sense, as they as they could, but by divine providence. No one could accuse them of picking or having a preference to a particular division, if, after all, the Lord was the one who decided which division and which priest within this division was going to be participating and doing and serving. This way, and the pinnacle of priestly duties fell upon Zechariah. Not only was he to serve in the temple, which is a once in a lifetime honor, but he was chosen by lot among those that would be serving in the temple to be the one to burn incense unto God in the holy place at the antechamber of the holy of holies. Dr. Sproul comments, Israel had 18,000 priests divided among the different groups. 14 priests of those 18,000 were given the privilege of offering the incense on the altar during the course of a single year. Those are some numbers. 18,000 of those only 14 
would be the ones to do that. And of course, of that, only one would be the one to pray. Continuing with Dr. Sproul's comment, that means that the vast majority of priests never in their lifetime had the opportunity to offer this sacred task in the holy place of the temple. How did a priest get the opportunity for this sacred task? He wasn't elected by his fellow priests to do it, nor was there a contest to determine who was the most righteous of the priests. No, the only one who could choose a priest for this sacred service was God himself. And he did it through the casting of lots. When Zechariah got the word, he must have been overwhelmed to receive such a spiritual blessing that would be the high point of his entire priesthood, end quote. We stop and we think all of these things, all of these little details that Luke record for us are pivotal to our understanding of the wondrous events that are unfolding in this historical account. That They reveal the outworking of God's providence and they illuminate for us the kind of prayer that Zechariah was offering up before the Lord. We stop and we think of how it is that this was a once in a lifetime opportunity. How not many of the priests would, how this was only chosen in the, in the truest sense, not by luck as the world would call it. Oh, well, that's just chance. That's just luck. No, they recognized this was God choosing. And so when we come to see that God chose a man whose name the Lord remembers, God remembers, it it is no coincidence. It is no luck, but a real wonderful panorama and an outworking, a drama of what is about to happen and how the righteousness of this man being childless means much as going there. Of all the ones, Lord, you're going to pick the childless priest? You know, there's so many of us priests that have kids that have raised them up in the ways of the Pharisees. They're obeying every single one. They tithe mint and dill and cumin. Lord, why did you choose The childless one. Is he not a sinner? After all, that was a part of our meditation last week, right? The the grave misunderstanding that people had at the time. Well, if you sin, then that's the reason why you're blind. If you sin, then that's the reason why you are lame. Or surely if you have no children, it is because you have some kind of sin that is unconfessed before the Lord. And yet, Luke reveals for us that is not the case. That as Christ said, it is for God's glory. And we see that this is for God's glory. At the same time, though, there is the opportunity for misunderstanding. Because this entire scenario involves a man who is childless, a prayer, and then the mention of a child being born. I mentioned a few Advent series ago that the, the misconception is that what Zechariah was doing when praying before God was asking for God to give him a child. And that when the angel Gabriel then arrives and says, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. That there it is. And that's, that's what happened. That he was there, and he was praying and offering up incense and said, Lord, please give me a son. This is my time. I can now bring this plea and this petition before the holy place. But that couldn't be further from the character that Luke describes and reveals for us is Zechariah. He is a contrite and righteous man who obeys the law and follows blamelessly after all of God's statutes. This was not a broken-hearted man coming in and selfishly praying for his own needs, but a righteous man who is going in and obeying 
what his duties are. What were the duties of the priest that were, was to offer up the incense? It was to pray and ask of the Lord on behalf of the nation, not on behalf of himself. He is a man who has striven in every way and in everything to please God, a man who despite growing old and not having children had not been bitter and abandoned the faith or grown lax in his obedience to God's statutes and commands, but stood firm and led his wife in doing likewise. But does that seem like the kind of man who's going to now say, I am going to take advantage of this opportunity for my own sake, this once in a lifetime opportunity? No, of course not. He would rather and did execute his service and temple duties as he would be expected to by the Lord. He wouldn't take lightly the pinnacle of priestly duties and the offering up of incense and the intercessory prayer for the nation by interjecting a plea for his own childlessness. From everything that Luke has written about Zechariah, we can expect nothing less than utmost obedience to follow and serve God in executing his duties faithfully unto the Lord. And of course, that then further highlights how wondrous the Lord is in answering the plea of intercession for the nation by giving him a son and the son who would be the fulfillment of what Zechariah's name means, the remembrance of the Lord. So we then, thanks to Luke, have the right understanding of who Zechariah is. And when we get to verses 10 and 11, we see the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Again, there are so many incredible details. We have Zechariah, the righteous man, going in and doing his priestly duties, going into the holy place where everything would be set up for him. And these other priests would walk in with him and make sure everything was prepared for him to do what he was supposed to do. And then they would depart from where he was and he would be left alone to burn up the incense at the appointed time or when a signal came to do so and offer up the intercessory prayer. Now, Luke doesn't explicitly tell us whether this offering of incense was done in the morning or in the evening sacrifice. But in either case, after the other priest would leave Zechariah alone, he would wait for the signal, and then proceed to do his priestly duties. Another detail for us to, to bear in mind in the, the backdrop, and it's often lost in the backdrop of, of this incredible scene, is that little word multitude there. The fact that there was a multitude of people. In verse 10, the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. Now, this does give us a bit of a hint as to which hour it was, Dr. Sproul comments saying prayers were offered for the nation on these occasions, both in the morning and in the evening. But the vast multitude of people came in the late afternoon at dusk for the offering of these prayers. They gathered outside the temple to pray and watch the smoke that came out of the temple because when the incense burned, the smoke spiraled up through the roof of the temple and that was the signal for the people to fall on their faces in the courtyard in thanksgiving that the prayers of intercession on their behalf had been offered. They were accustomed, after they saw the smoke, to seeing the priests soon come out of the temple, and they would all rejoice together. And quote. So this, this multitude is really something that we should pay attention to in contrast to the many other multitudes. There's multitudes mentioned throughout the word of God. If we were in John, then we know that the particular multitude that followed Christ in different points in time weren't always 
very faithful, weren't always very righteous. As a matter of fact, there was an entire multitude that claimed to believe, and yet John tells us that the Lord knew that they did not, in fact, in their heart, genuinely believe. But this multitude is a multitude that is demonstrated within the light of the 400-year silence. It is a multitude of faithful gathered in one place, morning or evening, day after day, rejoicing. The prayer of intercession, the prayer of deliverance, the prayer of come Messiah has been offered up. They waited daily for the priest to offer up the prayer of intercession. They fell on their faces in joy and anticipation that it would come. And this is why Luke informs us later on that in verses 21 and 22 that this multitude started to wonder at the reason why Zechariah delayed. That they knew roughly how long it took for a priest to go in, for a priest to offer up in the, the incense and the prayer before God for the nation and this time would not turn out to be like the rest. And we should note also that from all the way back in Exodus, God established this, this connection between incense burning and the prayers of the saints. Now that doesn't mean go out to the Dollar Tree and buy you some incense sticks and burn them up. When you're praying in morning and evening and afternoon before the Lord, no, no, we're, we're rather seeing the, the biblical both types and shadows and, and symbolisms that are there of that connection between the burning of incense and uh, the burning of a sweet aroma before the Lord and prayers before the Lord. It's, it's a fact that with all honesty, is oftentimes ignored in modernity that our prayers are supposed to be an act of worship, an act of obedience unto God, and thus should be pleasing to Him. That This is, again, yet another tidbit that not only reveals the righteousness of Zechariah, this isn't a man going in selfishly asking for what the Lord has said no to for decades. This is a man who submits in prayer before the Lord. It's something that characterizes the righteous men of prayer that we see in the scriptures. Men like Daniel, who prayed morning, noon, and night, regardless of the day, because when you recognize that prayer is not about you, but about growing in Christ, growing in submission, and worshiping God, it makes a world of difference. In Psalm 141, verses 1 and 2, David says, O oh Lord, I call upon you. Hasten to me. Give ear to my voice when I call to you. Let my prayer be counted as incense before you, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Most of us know a little bit in this connection of this, this next one of incense and prayer. Maybe not so much of Psalm 141 verses 1 and 2, but if anyone said, hey, do you know incense and prayer? Where's that connection? Especially in, in, in the inundated uh, dispensationalist community that most Christians live in now, you're going to go to Revelation. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Or, of course, Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 through 4. So, Revelation 5 verse 8, and now Revelation 8, verses 3 through 4. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer 
with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. So again, we, we see the prayers of God's faithful have always been likened to or connected with the pleasing aroma of the incense of God. Now, what does that mean? That means that like with everything in the regulative principle, with everything in our acts of worship, we regulate it by what God says. Could you offer up any incense? Whatever you wanted? No, likewise, you don't offer up your prayer however you wanted, but informed by the word of God. We know there were consequences for offering up unauthorized incense before the Lord. Leviticus chapter 10 verses 1 and 3 the infamous strange fire, unauthorized fire, or we could say the unauthorized incense, because that's what happened. Now, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, and again, this is relevant for Christians as we understand the connection between offering up what God had commanded and what God had said was to be offered up as far as incense and prayer. Moses says, this is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. And before all people, I will be glorified. We sanctify God when we pray as he has decreed. We are to pray as he has demonstrated in the scriptures. We should pray. And this, in turn, glorifies God among all other people. Again, to connect it to what we were Talking about this morning in the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. When you mourn over the abominable acts in this nation, the surgical slaughtering of young boys and young girls, the medicinal destruction of a body by pumping it full of unnatural testosterone, estrogen, synthetic. And that's not even getting into the abominable acts of the slaughtering of infants in the womb. And you pray as the Psalms show, Lord God, Deal with these people, these unjust people who sacrifice to these idols of self, these Molech, modern Molech worshipers. When you pray in such a way, it is definitely contrary to the modern ideology of meekness and Christian prayer, is it not? How many would say, you don't pray in precatory psalms. That was just an Old Testament thing. Well then, how do you know how to pray? If not what is clearly demonstrated in the scriptures, the woe and contriteness of your own sin being brought to the forefront, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart you will not despise. Or as David had said, in the psalm that was led by the judgment of God coming for his interaction with Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. The recognition of these realities. Only God can wash us. Only God can purify us. Only God can cleanse us. Only God. Only God. Only God. Rather than I want. I can do. Help me to do this. We need more than God's aid. 
we need his equipping. And the faithful have always been marked in the scriptures by a robust life of obedient and fervent prayer. That obedience doesn't stop simply because his people don't receive an immediate answer. For 400 years, the faithful remnant in Israel continued to obey God. They continued to wait for him to answer their plea. They didn't say, okay, guys, hey, look, it's been 300 years. I think our people have waited long enough. We should stop this whole intercessory prayer in the mornings and evenings. No? Don't you you think it's gone on long enough? No, they did not. Just as God's faithful now, this side of the cross, when they take the Lord's Supper faithfully, do not say, it's been 2,000 years, can we stop saying, come Lord Jesus, come? It's been 2,000 years, can we stop meditating on the consummation that is to come? It's been how many wars, how many famines, how many destructions, how many earthquakes in the past 2,000 years? We should just give up hope. 